Today's guest is a certified public accountant, certified in financial forensics, certified fraud examiner, a chartered global management accountant, and a speaker, to name a few of her qualifications. Our guest is a proud Oklahoma native who enjoys helping her clients. She tailors her representation based on each client's unique needs, whether it be for designing an estate plan, litigating an estate matter, or helping a business owner implement a successful plan. I'd like to welcome a shareholder of Barber & Barks, Ms. Kara Vincent. Hi Kara, it's great to have you on today. Thank you, it's great to be here. Great. Uh, let's take a few minutes and can you tell our audience, you know, your story and a little bit about your background? Okay, well, so um, as you said, I'm a native Oklahoman. Uh, my uh, friends and I, when we were in college, used to laugh. They would travel to another country and I would send a postcard when I crossed state lines uh, <laughs> because we <laughs> were just, uh, I was here and my life was here. I had children early on and so... Um, I was just kind of, of planted where I was and I grew where, where I was planted. Um, I started out in my career as an auditor and a tax accountant. I worked in public accounting and did that for a number of years until I, I moved into what we would call the industrial side of accounting. <laughs> Maybe I'm the only one that calls that, that <laughs> but doing um, SEC filings and compliance work for publicly traded companies. and. Um, and actually, in that role, that was the first time I ever discovered a fraud. Um, and it had to do with uh, document altering and taking signatures from old documents and putting them on new documents. And um, it, was, it was pretty interesting to watch that unfold and to know that I have had figured this part out. And we actually... Um, were able to give that information to the SEC. Now, I don't know that they ever did anything with it, but uh, it was it kind of opened my eyes to the forensic world and piqued my interest. Um, and so as after that, that kind of segued into law school. I went into law school and when I first went in, I thought I would, might do SEC work, um, <laughs> compliance work. Um, I had encountered an attorney and working in in public accounting um, and he had passed the bar and I thought man if he could do it my organizational skills alone will get me um, through <laughs> because uh, I handed him an original one day and he said oh don't give me that I'll lose it and I thought well what kind of person <laughs> says that to their client so um, and and I in fact did get through law school and um, and so I would have been able over my career to merge the accounting and forensic part with the legal part and and create kind of a niche for for what I do. Um, and so I had have gone through a couple of iterations of, of my own law firm. And then in March of 2019, uh, myself and my partner and our staff merged into Barbara and Bart's and we've been here since 2019. So my practice consists of um, estate and trust work, designing estate plans, um, administering estates, probates, and guardianships, and then doing litigation, and that's where the fraud component comes in. We do um, the preliminary investigations because of the skill set. Um, I can kind of dig through what I'm looking at to see if there really is an issue, uh, and then I can bring in other people. I cannot you know, be the expert and the investigator and the attorney. So I utilize other people. And then I do expert witness testimony. When other attorneys need help, um, they engage me to assist in that role. So um, it's a pretty, pretty busy practice and it's developed over a number of years. That sounds exciting. It is. And <laughs> through your experience, as you mentioned, an auditor and law school and estate trust planning and uh, what's the one thing you wish you had known when you began your career? So I would say that the thing I have um, come to understand, and I wish my younger person had known that, is that your career is not necessarily a straight path. Um, when you start out thinking, okay, I want to do X, whatever that is, you envision, and we all do, you know, I take this step, and then I take the next mm -hmm. step, and then ultimately I get to my goal, and it's just this linear path that, that gets me there. And that is not at all what happens. 
and um, your ultimate goal may be a combination of different skill sets. So don't limit yourself. <clears throat> uh, when I started in public accounting, I would have never thought that eventually I would be an attorney doing forensic accounting. That's just not something that was on my radar screen. But um, I followed that that interests and it got me to the point where I could do something that I really enjoy. So um, I think that's the thing is don't pigeonhole yourself into thinking you've got one path and it's linear. Allow yourself to uh, explore all your interests because it may get you to the ultimate goal, which is a really great career that you love. That's great advice. Uh, so you decided to go to law school later uh, while you're working as an auditor? Yeah, it was uh, it was interesting. I was an older student. I was okay. in my 30s. Most of the students were in their 20s. Uh, we had a criminal law professor who gave us a hypothetical of um, a parents who had left their 15 year old alone for the weekend, and he threw a big party, and mm -hmm. somebody got drunk, and there was an accident. And so the the big ask was, who's responsible? Are the parents responsible? Right. And of course, I was like, yes, because I had a 15 year old, and I'm like, what person leaves their 15 year old alone for the weekend? She felt the same way because she was older and we both had kids. All the 20 something year olds were like, why would the parents be responsible? They didn't do anything. <laughs> I was like, well, <laughs> that was the difference between people who had 15 year olds and people who did not. And so right. it really, it, it, it solidified for me the distinction between I'm an old person here in law school <laughs> and these young people are, are significantly younger, but um, it was good. I, I enjoyed yeah. it. That's great. I always think it's great. Like you said, it's never a linear path mm -mm. and it's never too late. Especially That's right. if you, you know, you want to go back and, um, you know, get yourself a additional education and change. It takes bravery too. <laughs> to do that, right? It does. A lot had changed between the first time I was in uh, college <laughs> and the second time I was in college. And somebody commented the first week of law school and said, you, you're very organized. And I said, this is fear yeah uh, this is an organization this is fear in action and so um yeah it was it was fun it was fun and i enjoyed it i'm glad i don't ever have to do it again <laughs> yeah so one time yeah, thing. exactly we're finished <laughs> so what's the best part of your job and why uh i well i've always said i love the clients mm -hmm. um so doing the estate planning portion i meet all kinds of people Mm -hmm. I am especially fond of elderly people. I don't know why. Um, maybe I was born in the wrong era, but <laughs> uh, I find them to be very frank and open. Uh, once you reach a certain age, you really don't care what anybody thinks, so you say what you're thinking. Um, we had a client who came in one day and told me, I can't have chocolate because of health issues. So periodically, I just unwrap a piece of chocolate, put it in my mouth, switch it around a little bit, and then spit it out. And she said it as if she was doing something really, really, you know, bad. Uh, she was upset that she could not have wild turkey anymore. And at first I thought, well, she must be talking about, you know, turkey, oh, Thanksgiving wow. turkey. No, she's talking about hardcore liquor yes. uh, and she didn't have it. She was upset about that. Uh, she was just fascinating. And I find uh, a connection there. I really enjoy meeting the clients. And I enjoy the clients. Um, who we do litigation for. And that when there is something that's that's wrong, a misappropriation or somebody stealing money or somebody has not administered things correctly um, and breached that fiduciary responsibility, um, you form a connection with your clients because you're fighting for them. And, and when they trust that what you're doing is going to be for their benefit and they trust that you're gonna take action for them, they you become close. And so I, I enjoy that. I good. enjoy that. Yeah, that sounds good. Sounds fun. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I can hear that you love to talk about litigation, fraud, and, and embezzlement. So what would you change about this industry if you had all the resources in the world? Oh, my goodness. Well, um, I, I have thought about that. Um, I will tell you, you know, there are, you can think about things in a very broad world view. And I don't know about the world, and I'm not trying to change the world. But when I think about what I could change, I think about the things that reasonably I could really affect change in. And that has to do it on a, on a local level, a state level. So um, when we're doing uh, fraud and embezzlement issues in a trust context, um, 
and I won't bore you with all the details, but there are certain statutes that govern that. And under our Oklahoma statutes, the court can order an accounting to be performed or to be pro provided. Um, if the trust does not require an accounting or if the um, trustee doesn't provide one when they're supposed to, the only avenue for a beneficiary is to sue in court and to take it to the court and ask them to order that accounting to be provided. And then the court can say, yes, provide an accounting, but there's no definition for what that accounting looks like. Mm. So I, I went, you know, as an auditor, I would go in and say, you know, where are your records? And they would point to 25 boxes over oh, the no. and you'd be digging through them. And such is the life of somebody who is required to provide an accounting but doesn't want to provide an accounting. So you go in and you say, okay, we want your accounting. And what you get are all the source documents that would be required to make an accounting. And then the beneficiary who is is often financially um, deficient because they haven't gotten what they were supposed to from the trustee uh, is forced to put together an accounting. They're forced to do the work. Otherwise, you're in court battling. Mm -hmm. I would shift that burden to the trustee. I would change the statute to require an accounting, and I would put in a definition in the statutes of what that accounting has to have in it. Um, and then allow that if the beneficiary doesn't want to require that, they can waive it. But it puts the onus on the trustee to provide it. And then the power then is with the beneficiary to waive it instead of the reverse. Um, it it puts the, the responsibility um, where it's supposed to be. And so I've talked to a couple of, of senators that I know um, and have been trying to think about how we could make that into law. But that's what I would change if I think about just in the next five years, what would I want to do and what do I think would help? That's what it would be. And that's personal because it's all relative, right, to what we're all dealing with. So right now, that's what's in my focus. That's very practical. Well, <laughs> well, you know, it's not. It may not be very sexy, but it is practical, and it and I think it will directly benefit um, the litigation frontier yeah. in Oklahoma, uh, because right now it is just getting worse. Um, so the beneficiary is responsible for that. Not no, they're not. They're not supposed to be. Oh, the problem right. is that because our statutes are crafted the way they are, mm -hmm. and because. Um, there is very little definition. Even the Uniform Trust Code doesn't require a, a specific type of accounting. Oh. And so you're left to the discretion of whatever the trustee would right. define an accounting to be. And, um, and so I would like that more defined and for there mm -hmm. to be an absolute responsibility uh, that with no loopholes to right. be able to get around it. Just so. to be kind of, yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's great. It's totally practical. Sounds like something <laughs> that you could possibly, you know, achieve one day and, you know, let us keep us in the loop with that. And I'll I, will. I will. You know, it's not like I said, it's not very, um, you know, it's not world peace. It's not all, all of that kind of thing. And, and it's certainly not um, FBI, espionage, <laughs> here. But it's something that I see on a daily basis that would directly impact my clients. Well, right. It really help those uh, people that really need it. It makes a big right. difference. That's right. right. Wow. So in the forensic accounting sphere, you know, hiding hidden assets and tax fraud are two of the most sought after topics. What do you think is the biggest challenge in this area and how would you solve them? Mm. So I, the biggest problem that I encounter is time. Um, time because the source documents needed to follow the cash, so to speak, mm -hmm. are gone. Bank statements are gone. Um, and so the, the thing that I would do is encourage people that, you know, we, we talk about in other contexts, if you see something, say something. Uh, I find, especially in this area of the Crescent Estates, the family dynamic is an overlaying factor mm. in in this forensic, uh, they stole money, there's gifting, there's all kinds of, Dana, I think mom loved you best, you took, got the bicycle, you stole my girlfriend. It all, you know, <laughs> kind of filters together. Yeah. And and so because of the, all of those other variables, a lot of people do, do not say anything until mm. mom's finally gone. Or dad's finally gone right and so that time works against you so if in a 
as you say, if I had all the resources and I could do anything, what I would do is keep um, financial statements longer, keep bank statements longer, um, find a way to allow financial institutions to retain that information because mm -hmm. it's very useful to us. And I would encourage my clients or anybody else that if something's happening that you think may cause a problem later, say something now, mm -hmm. address it now. Um, you know, as a, as a society, we're pretty non-confrontational. Right. People don't like to talk about the elephant in the room, so they mm -hmm. will walk around it. Some people will even drape a blanket to put over it, but they're not going to talk about it. And so it, it requires a recognition of the issues and addressing them sooner rather than later. But I think that's the biggest challenge. Good to know. Good to know. Usually, yeah, I think things usually come out later and probably not at the best time. Uh, so that's good to know. Keep your documents, keep your statements. It, it's true. I have, um, we have a, a litigation case on a trust and we needed, um, we needed some proof about, uh, about the intent underlying a transaction and the people involved in it. Mm -hmm. And we found in records a copy of the front part of a check. That's it. We didn't have the back and there's no way we would have gotten it if they did not have that copy in the box we would have never been able to show the intent. And so it can be the the change, the 180 change in the case wow. or in, in the proof that you need, but oftentimes it's already gone and wow. there's no way to get it. So how do you think technology can help investigators spot red flags? Well, as you're well aware, there are all kinds of software programs. <laughs> I don't need to tell you or, or any of your listeners, but, um, you know, the, that that um, creation of software programs to analyze data on a, on a rapid basis and to take large amounts and, and put it together has been a game changer. Mm -hmm. What used to take forever and now can take less time. And you get the raw data put together into some order so that then you can actually do the an analysis. And you can spot inconsistencies and find patterns in the information. And that I think is key because it helps you, like I said, time is your enemy in all of this stuff. Right. So having software programs, having um, technology that can process the data quicker to allow the investigator to complete the analysis more efficiently is always gonna be a good good thing. I agree, time, time is a thief. It is, and it, you know, in a, in a state and trust, you're dealing with a lot of documents. And like you said, over time, and sometimes you just need that one piece of paper. Well, and not only, not only, you know, people yeah. think about trusts and estates as being mom's, you know, bank account, but sometimes there are businesses within right. the trust. So you're not just talking about, did somebody take something from mom's bank account? You're talking about, did they rob out of the company? Right. Uh, especially if you're talking about a, um, a mom and pop business that was created in the garage, you know, mom always owned the company. Yeah. Uh, she, she, as the primary owner, can do whatever she wants to. I mean, exactly. she's not supposed to. She's supposed to keep records and, and do everything the way it's supposed to be done. But we all know those small businesses and the owners will make loans to themselves and pay personal stuff out of their business account. The problem is that the children then after mom's gone, start continuing to do that. And usually, there, I always say there's three children. There's always three children. One of them is heavily involved in the business. The other two aren't. And there's always a diamond ring, and it's always missing at mom's death. So all of those factors, sometimes you have a business in there. So there can be very um, complex um, transactions happening and large amounts of data to weed through. So the Absolutely. software programs really help. Absolutely. So let's kind of switch it up. Um, so I've been kind of seeing a little bit about these Pandora papers, right? And it's tied to alleged money laundering uh, done by key political figures and some uh, celebrities. What role do investigators have in limiting the future occurrences? So that's really, that was a hard one. Um, uh, one of my good friends that I've known for a number of years is Ziva Brandstetter, and she works for the Washington Post. So I can remember when they were investigating this, and of course she couldn't tell me anything. She just kept saying, it's going to be big. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I just knew there was something big coming, and then it came out, and I went, ah, yes, I see this. <laughs> so here's the problem with that, is collusion. I mean, 
you don't just have one person working on this. You don't just have one person hiding information. You have whole companies, uh, groups of political figures, businesses. I mean, this is global. Think about how many, if you've looked through that, how many investigators it took. It was a global effort to uncover this stuff and dig down into it. And so I would love for it to be like a movie where, you know, the one person is able to sneak into the, the you know, the basement of a building and find the one folder that had them. Mis- That's never going to happen in this kind of context. Mm-mm. And so, you know, when you talk about how do we fix that and what do, what do investigators do, there's always going to be limitations in, in attempting to work with the information and get it, to even get it. Um, this had to be leaked. So when we talk about forensics and um, how how people find out about fraud and embezzlement, a lot of it's by just, you know, tip lines and people, people giving information, you know, when they shouldn't have and sharing information on whistleblowers and, and that kind of thing. So... You know, the, the easiest answer is start implementing uh, procedures so that everything has to be disclosed and having it be a global agreement between countries as to how they're going to operate. Well, okay, that sounds really great in theory, but is that really going to work? Plus, you have the weighing interests. As an attorney, I'm thinking about, you know, uh, personal privacy. You know, do you really get to know everything I'm doing? Um, against the good of society and the best interests of, of society. Well, we already see that play out in the United States. I mean, all, I, all that came to mind when I thought about that was vaccinations. You know, what's the public policy versus the personal privacy? And, mm-hmm. and so if you see how that's gone, what does that look like on a global scale when you're talking about financial reporting? I don't know that's a really great answer right now. <laughs> I I look at it and think, man, that is a massive undertaking, and I think um, what they were able to uncover is fantastic. But how how does that translate into some kind of policy that's going to help um, investigators in the future to be able to uncover that kind of thing? That I don't know, and that, that probably is above my pay grade. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> So so let's talk about, you know, a case that you have um, um, taken care of. So can you share an interesting case that you've handled and maybe some key takeaways from it? Yeah. So I talked about time being a problem. Mm -hmm. So we have one right now. Um, It's unfortunate, but sometimes attorneys, I mean, they're just people. And so Mm -hmm. they'll make mistakes. and, Mm -hmm. um, And sometimes they get lost in their needs above those of their clients. So I'll, mm-hmm. I'll leave it at that. But we have, I have a, a client right now and his father passed away. And um, after his father died, he discovered there were all these loans that had been made to a previous attorney. Mm-hmm. Um, and in fact, the attorney, um, and I'll say alleged because we have, we have no idea whether mm-hmm. this can be proven, but the information appears to show that he signed the back of a check written to his client and forged his name. Mm-hmm. And and these transactions were going into what we call an IO flood account. Oh, yep. account. So attorneys have to keep those for their clients. When somebody pays me a retainer, it goes in trust, and I only get to take the funds after I've actually done work to mm-hmm. earn it. Um, and so this money was going into the trust account and there was no accounting for it and no invoices. Mm-hmm. and. So in, in looking at the data that we actually have, um, it looks like it took somewhere around $450,000 over a period of a year and a half from his client and never fully repaid it all. And so we're, we're dealing with all of that. But the problem is the client's now deceased. So who's the best, um, best um, evidence? It would be the client to say what he knew and understood and now he's gone. And the bank records that we need to prove some of this stuff go back to 2008, 2009. Well, most banks do not hold their their um, statements for longer than seven years. So you're really in a time crunch. So we're calling through the information that was available to us in his records and pulling that information. We have 
handwritten notes. So it becomes less about let's follow the cash and more about not only can we not absolutely follow the cash, we have to piece together intent and understanding from other documents that were inside of the record. So, um, you know, if forensic accounting, if you're, if you're just dealing with numbers, can be pretty straightforward. But the kind of investigations that we wind up doing are a hybrid and it's not just about numbers and it will never just be about numbers because you have so many different factors that have to come into play. So if I had known this gentleman in 2008 or 2009, I would have been gathering up bank statements. I would have been keeping those records and we just don't have them and we can't get them. But it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, yeah, you know, there are there are a couple of pieces that I won't go into right now, but um, yeah, we're we're actively trying to resolve that and figure out what actually happened. So that's kind of uh, that's kind of interesting, and it, yeah. it highlighted when I at, when I think about that question, what's the biggest hurdle and what's the biggest problem? It's time, and this is the prime example of that. We can't get to that information, and and then I have cases with the elderly, elder abuse is oh. on the rise um financial yeah. ex, ex, not extortion sometimes extortion yeah. with the elderly um is it, it's just uh, it, it appall it's appalling but understandable when you think about it in context of greed um people see somebody who's in their 90s they're like how much longer are they going to need this money anyway i'll just it's you know terrible. i can help them and then i'll take it um and and within the family you know we talked about the layers of family yeah. dynamic i can't uh, believe the family dynamic in these elderly abuse cases oh my gosh sometimes you'll have child a who takes something from mm -hmm. mom and b and c are not so much upset that a took it but more about the fact that a got more than they did yeah and they didn't get a chance to take some themselves <laughs> And you just, I had one, uh, we were negotiating a settlement on a, for a client and her son was there and we get a great resolution for the client. And the son looks at me and says, so, so what does this mean for me? What, what do I get out of this? And I, I had to look at him and say nothing because this isn't about you. <laughs> in his mind it was. So it's, um, uh, it's kind of an epidemic in our society right now. Yes. There is a, um. There's a Netflix show called I Care A Lot. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually had a, a company here in Tulsa reach out to me and say, I need, we need you to watch this movie. We need you to talk about it and, and make sure that you can help us understand how this is not really going to happen. You know, how much of this is real and how much of this is, you know, liberties taken with a film. And um, there are obviously measures in place that would keep somebody from just losing their freedoms and their autonomy without having representation. But it was a little scary. Um, I will say Oklahoma has modified our Slayer statute. The Slayer statute uh, says that if you kill somebody, you don't get to inherit from them. And they have expanded that to say that if you're convicted of financially exploiting a vulnerable adult, so somebody that falls into that category, and the majority of elderly people do, yes. that you lose your inheritance. So if you're a child and you steal from your parents and you're convicted of that, you can lose your entire inheritance. So uh, it's, it's, we're recognizing it as happening. And so we're trying to implement some things to, to keep it from occurring. But it's, uh, it's, it's pretty shocking sometimes what people will do to their parents. It's shocking to hear how frequent and the things that they'll do um, and how often it is, it's like family. Uh, it is. So. I mean, I just look at people and think, I, I don't even understand that. I, I don't understand the um, concept of stealing from your parents and, your mom, yes, and, and not taking care of them. But some of it's cultural. Some of it's uh, just greed. Uh, there's just yeah. so many variables at play. There's a whole psychology of it all that is intriguing as well. Wow. So what advice would you give other professionals? So um, forensic accounting is and investigations are relevant in every, every area of the law. When I first, um, I, I was a CPA, then I went to law school, and then I became a certified fraud examiner. And so when I 
started doing the forensics, I thought, you know what, I'm an attorney, so I'll start focusing on the areas of law in which, you know, embezzlement, fraud may be most relevant. Mm -hmm. And so I started doing presentations on, you know, here's fraud in estates and trusts. That was the area I first started practicing in, so of course you go with what you know, right? Mm -hmm. But what, then I found out that it's in bankruptcy, it's in family law, it's it encompasses every area of law. There's always where there, wherever there's greed, there's going to be a component of this. So I started doing, you know, family law when spouses are hiding assets, bankruptcy when a debtor is hiding assets or improperly transferring assets, um, contracts um, with business partners and conflict and misappropriating assets, um, trusts and estates, fiduciaries. So what I found is that I just need to follow what I really enjoy in that particular area and combining it with my law career, it, it then becomes easier. And I think it goes back to that. It's not a linear path. It's not just like this straight line to whatever you're wanting to do that you need to find what you really enjoy about the forensic and just saying I do forensic investigations may be too broad. Maybe you narrow that down into the areas because every legal area uh, is going to have a component of that. And so you may find a, a niche that really fits your skill set and what you enjoy doing. You know, I still get lost in spreadsheets and doing analysis. Some people would think that is the craziest thing, but I can take data and start looking at the analysis and and tracking transactions and I'll look up and four hours have passed. And so I know that about myself. So find what that is that you really enjoy and then focus on that and you'll you'll find the place to use your skills. That's great advice. That's great advice. So it, it was nice talking to you today. You shared a lot of fun stories uh, about your career and experience. And some of the key takeaways I got from it was you know, if you have a goal or you're passionate about something, go for it, right? That yeah. means law school at 30, law school at 30. Why not? That's right. And, <laughs> and uh, save your bank statements. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, now you don't have to save them in paper. Just scan them in. I mean, right. space in the cloud is not expensive. So right. just upload them and keep them, at, you know. The bigger thing is make sure people aren't stealing from you. But exactly. if, you're, if you're concerned about it, save all your bank statements. <laughs> That's right. Save your documents. All right. Well, thank you so much. It was uh, great having you on and we'll stay in touch. Okay. Thanks so much, Michelle. Thanks.